Hello everybody and welcome to the Gyrocopter Flying Club. You may have noticed some additional content and this is just a small taste of the future. So please do subscribe and select alerts because the subject matter could be a little bit random and therefore hard to search for. Remember this isn't just gyroplane themed material. This will be for all aviation enthusiasts. So regardless of who you are, get involved. This is part 15 of the history of the gyroplane and in our last film we looked at some technology demonstrators that were to be based on the Lockheed C-130 transport and both gave a nod to Ferry Aviation's Rotodyne. So I thought for those who may not know I'd give some colour on the Rotodyne and some personal thoughts. There's no value add simply retelling a story that's been told well elsewhere and the world's authority today on the Rotodyne is undoubtedly David Gibbings. I attended his lecture at the Royal Aeronautical Society some years ago and happily I have found a film with similar material that belongs to David that I have linked via the playlist. I have also got the original Fairy Aviation promotional film and no less than two sales brochures which I hope you all find very interesting. The facts, figures and detail of the programme you'll all find in that film that's linked via the playlist but for now Here's some quick background to the project and some thoughts on its ultimate demise of my own from research that I've done over the years. As you'll know from our History of the Gyroplane series, Ferry Aviation had taken an interest in vertical lift post the Second World War with staffing from Weir Sierva Company. Its first aircraft, the Gyrodyne, had unpowered rotors and built as a private venture. But when the first prototype crashed, killing all on board, the project came to an end in 1949. But by then, a second prototype had been built, and it was that that was used to, as a test bed to investigate rotors powered by tip jets. Ferry had employed some ex-Dobbenhoff aeronautical engineers who were pioneers of tip jets from the Second World War. The tip jets were lit to provide initial lift at takeoff, then shut down in flight and the lift for flying done in auto rotation, and then relit to land. Transition to forward flight with the jet gyrodyne was made in the mid 1950s. The project met further goals and it convinced Ferry to commit to two tip jet projects the Ultralight and then the Rotodyne. The ultralight was powered by a turbo mecha Blackburn gas turbine. Originally it competed for a British military requirement for an army helicopter in the aerial observation role. It ultimately lost to Saunders Row Skeeter in that configuration. Ferry then attempted to proceed with development of the ultralight independently, promoting the type towards a civil market. It also undertook a four-year test program with the British Navy to operate from smaller ships, but that program was abandoned in 1959 as the Navy decided that it needed a bigger aircraft. Ferry began the Rotodyne project in 1946, partly funded by British European Airways to meet a perceived need for a rotary wing airliner with 50 passengers to be flown directly into city centres, and also a British military requirement for a transport casualty evacuation aircraft. In 1953 a single prototype was built. It might be useful at this point to take a look at the landscape in the UK at the time. The helicopter had been invented and in the 1950s there was great excitement and a feeling that soon everybody would be flying from city centre to city centre via a helicopter. Indeed in a few European cities there was a helicopter air taxi service. The UK lagged slightly and in 1958 a design study had been done by the British Helicopter Association to look at the development at a heliport. Ultimately Westland took the bull by the horns and built its own heliport privately at Battersea. Location of course was key as the heliport was to serve the main London airports of the time being Gatwick, Southend, London Airport, now known of course as Heathrow. There was also a study of transit times from the heliport to various key points in London. 
from road at Hyde Park Corner, Westminster, and then by boat to Blackfriars. The rationale of the Rotodyne being that while short haul air transport was popular, the time taken to travel from the airport itself to an intended city centre destination was actually the longest time of all as road traffic was increasing. Broadly, the Rotodyne made most city centres centres around an hour away. The failure for the Rotodyne is often placed at the foot of its noise, but that isn't really true. Yes, it was noisy, but tipjet noise was being tackled effectively, and there was confidence at Ferry that it would have been solved. Indeed, technically, the biggest issue faced was vibration with the need to stiffen the rear of the aircraft, as it wasn't seen as suitable for passenger transport. Ground resonance was also an issue. Ferry had placed dampers at the rotor head, and finally solved the problem with undercarriage dampers, but it gave a curious ground movement. The Americans were very interested with the potential requirement for 200 aircraft, but to secure funding from the American Mutual Aid Program, it required initial funding to be secured from the home nation, and Ferry couldn't persuade the RAF to order the 25 aircraft required. The project was ultimately cancelled in 1962, after BEA also declined to place an order. It did cite noise as the issue, but the reality of mass profitable city centre to city centre air travel had become apparent, and no other UK city airports had been built. I hope you enjoyed the film, and I recommend now that you take a look at the David Gibbings film on the Rotodyne, which gives a much greater technical perspective of its programme of development, and also Ferry Aviation's own promotional film. I've also linked two sales and publicity brochures for your visual enjoyment. Thanks for watching and see you soon.